So what is clean coal and when will it vindicate climate smart Queensland? Once upon a time, clean coal meant low sulphur coal. Now that CO2 is the main concern, clean coal technology means just about anything that produces slightly less CO2 than the older technologies did. So for example, in Victoria at the moment, the plan is to build a new coal-fired power station run on gasified brown coal. And that's going to be roughly as clean as adding a brand spanking new black coal-fired power station. But apparently it still qualifies as clean, even though it's going to add another 3 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. There are various other clean coal technologies. Underground gasification, for example. Upgrading low-grade coal, low coals into briquettes. Tacking small solar and biomass powered generators onto existing coal fired power stations. The practical impact is not to reduce or prevent coal emissions, it's to slow the rate of emissions um, per tonne of coal burned. Not so that we can burn less coal, but so we can burn a whole lot more. What people understand clean coal to mean, though, is carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as CCS, a process by which most CO2 produced in coal-fired power stations and potentially steel mills can be buried underground, resulting in 80 to 90 per cent fewer emissions. All the official graphs from the International Energy Agency on down assume CCS will work. The coal industry is investing billions in demonstration plants here and around the world, as are the state and federal governments in Australia. We're also the home base for the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute which is now backed by over 20 countries. And what's more, the G8 has targeted 20 large-scale uh, CCS plants around the world by 2020. So it certainly sounds like clean coal is full steam ahead. And if you dare go to the website of the World Coal Institute, you'll probably be impressed by just how much is already happening. According to their CCS counter, a whopping 48 million tonnes of CO2 has already been captured and stored. So clean coal's already here, right? Or is it? If you look more closely, a different picture starts to emerge. Of those 48 million captured and stored tonnes of CO2 promoted by the World Coal Institute, almost none has come from coal. The overwhelming share has been injected into otherwise unviable oil reserves, not to save the planet, but to extract more oil. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the coal-fired power stations and steel mills using the coal. What's more, that 48 million tonnes is all the CO2 captured and stored underground by fossil fuel producers in history. And that's just something they've been doing now for a couple of decades. And to put that in proper context, I knocked up my own CCS counter, which shows that a similar quantity of CO2 from coal burning is not captured and stored every single day. That is, every 24 hours, all the emissions ever captured and stored are replaced by unclean coal use. But don't expect to see that CCS counter on the WCI website anytime soon. And don't expect them to acknowledge this other inconvenient fact. Not one coal-fired power station in the world is yet capturing and storing its CO2 emissions on an industrial scale. Not one. Former Premier Peter Beattie hit the nail on the head this week when he, he said that government and industry are sitting on their hands. In spite of all the talk about clean coal, nothing much has happened in the past 10 years, he said. For argument's sake, though, let's just assume that all goes well for clean coal. Let's ignore for a moment the sheer enormity of the task of building a global CCS infrastructure akin to the oil and gas industry in a fraction of that time. Let's ignore the many trillions of dollars involved. Let's gloss over the projections of the Federal Treasury, who in 2008 suggested that CCS would probably not be commercially viable in Australia even with a carbon price until as late as 2033. Let's suspend the reality that once CCS is viable here, the process of replacing and retrofit or retrofitting all of Australia's coal-fired power stations will take decades. And let's set aside for the moment the certainty that our coal export customers will use CCS much, much later than we do, especially those developing countries that have no absolute emission reduction targets to worry about. Let's try to imagine the best case scenario for CCS. Well, that scenario is the one targeted by the G8, that worldwide by 2020 there'd be 20 large, large CCS demonstration plants. 
If all goes well, and assuming some of those plants actually relate to coal, because that's not guaranteed, that might save roughly 150, 150 million tonnes of CO2 annually, and that's a pretty conservative estimate. Once more, it's impressive until you have the context. If, notwithstanding more efficient use of coal, coal consumption grows by a quarter by 2020, and that's also a conservative estimate, while the G8 is busy promoting perhaps 150 million tonnes of CO2 a year saved by clean coal, over 20 billion tonnes of CO2 annually would still be coming from coal use where the emissions are not captured and stored. In rough terms, by, 20, by 2020, about one in 135 coal-fired power stations and steel mills would be capturing and storing their emissions. Ultimately, though, Queensland isn't really banking that heavily on clean coal. We're banking heavily on Canberra, giving us national policies that enable us to claim low carbon status without cutting emissions or cutting exports. With Queensland's representation in federal parliament growing as its population grows, that strategy is working pretty well. There's lots of feigned outrage at the damage that federally imposed carbon prices and renewable energy mandates might inflict on Queensland, but there's really not much evidence to suggest that Canberra is any less determined than Queensland to double coal exports or interfere with our carbon addiction. By way of illustration, let's add up the impact of all the federal emission reduction measures. The 20% renewable energy target, the $6.2 billion green car program, solar hot water on 400,000 roofs, and what remains of the plan to insulate 2.7 million homes? If we include all the measures introduced since the Rudd-Gillard government was elected in 2007, on the figures of the Federal Department of Climate Change, the impact is to cut Australia's projected emissions in 2020 from around 680 million tonnes a year to around 660 million tonnes. Now that tiny saving leaves emissions more than 10% higher than they are right now. And as, a, as much as a carbon price is seen by many as the game-changing reform, there's actually no guarantee whatsoever that it's going to significantly reduce emissions here in Australia. All the rhetoric was about a carbon price capping emissions in Australia and making big polluters pay for the first time, but the actual proposals from Canberra would, not have, would have had the opposite effect. The so-called Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, for example, allowed unlimited importation of cheap carbon credits from abroad to count towards Australia's post-Kyoto emission targets. As Treasury's analysis in 2008 showed, even if we don't use this loophole to outsource only half of our post-Kyoto obligations, the actual greenhouse pollution occurring in Australia from our smokestacks and car exhausts wouldn't fall here for decades. With no limit whatsoever on the outsourcing, which is what the Rudd government proposed, reductions in greenhouse pollution in Australia would be even further away. Meanwhile, the money raised from emissions trading was going to be spent on giving the biggest polluters between 66 and 95 per cent of their emission permits for free. And as those industries grew, so too would their overall number of free permits and their overall emissions. The CPRS really only worked if emission cuts could be outsourced en masse to developing countries who are willing to sign up to forest protection deals on the cheap. Federally, the coalition wants to rely less on hiding carbon in foreign forests and a lot more on hiding carbon in agricultural soils in our backyard. But the bipartisan intent is much the same, cause it the addiction to fossil fuels, especially coal. And I hate to say, the equation is unlikely to change in a hurry, much as some people believe the precarious minority government in Canberra is going to force ambitious action. Let's not forget that our new Prime Minister was put in the position by a few union bosses who ascertained that three multinational coal mining companies would change the government through a relentless ad campaign unless Labor changed its leader. On day one in the job, she famously threw the, the door of, her door open to the mining industry and within days had cut a deal in their favour that saved them billions. Let's also not forget that our new climate change minister, meanwhile, is a former coal engineer and union rep who on his first day in the job reportedly declared the coal industry would be safe. So in the wake of Copenhagen and stalled emissions trading in the US, I would say the carbon lobby has more leverage than a year ago, not less. Naturally, the federal government wants the appearance of action, perhaps with a new trading scheme 
or a carbon tax, but expect the same sorts of outsourcing loopholes that enable Australia to use foreign forests and farm paddocks to mask its growing greenhouse pollution. And expect the biggest polluting companies in the domestic economy to again be offered billions of dollars in carbon subsidies, either through free permits or carbon tax rebates. And expect Canberra to keep ignoring the emissions generated by our coal exports, at least in the short term. Just don't bank on that lasting, though. I say that because the official future is on pretty thin ice. Some would say melting ice. When you look at the assumptions that underpin continued coal addiction, the assumption that carbon-intensive resources are our, are our economic backbone, that alternatives to coal either don't exist or are too expensive, they really just don't stand up to scrutiny. Contrary to popular myth, Australia is a modern services-based economy, and increasingly so. Coal is an important export, about 23% of our export basket. But it's only about 3 to 4% of our overall economy and about one-third of 1% 1 of jobs. That's roughly about as many people who work for advertising agencies or for McDonald's. Nor is coal quite the cash cow that we're led to believe. In New South Wales, for example, coal royalties are in a normal year about 1%, 3% in a good year. In Queensland, they're normally around 3%, rising to between 6 and 9% during a boom year like this one. But much of that royalty money is returned back to the industry. So when you realise the state is spending more on coal infrastructure than it's collected in coal royalties over the past decade, the notion that coal royalties fund Queensland schools, hospitals, police, etc., is a bit less persuasive. Also on thin ice is the notion that there's no alternative to coal. As was highlighted here in Brisbane last night when Beyond Zero Emissions held, their law held the Queensland launch of their Zero Carbon Australia stationary energy plan, there's no technical hurdle to Australia replacing all its coal-fired power with renewable sources over the next decade. All the technology required is already being deployed somewhere else in the world. Contrary to the myth, many of the technologies can also replace baseload electricity, solar thermal, biomass, and in some cases hydro as well. And in combination with backup from a small amount of natural gas, intermittent sources like wind can deliver something better than baseload. The only thing lacking right now is political will.